Yes. Let us begin our conversation, really, from, uh, you know, from an aspect that is a bit controversial. Now, you are scheduled to speak at Eden University in October of 2018. Unfortunately, you are deported back to your country. The reason that was given was that you are a security risk. Do you agree that you are a security risk to some African states? First of all, I think that is the question that had better be put to the administration of uh, President Lungu, who himself is a lawyer. If he thinks that I am a security risk, I will, I'm not a bearer of arms. I've not threatened the government of the Republic of Zambia. And I was amazed and amused at the same time that an administration led by a lawyer like Eja Lungu would, would consider that I'm a security threat. That, I think, is uh, the height of paranoia. And I have subsequently written to the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Zambia, to the Zambian High Commissioner in Nairobi, to tell me why they consider me to be a security risk. They have never heard the courtesy of responding. And, 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 and if the truth be told, the manner in which President Lungu is administering Zambia is in itself a testament to the fact that he's paranoid. Mm. But, 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 do you think this has affected the relationship that you have with Zambia, really? Not at all. I, I see, I mean, Zambia is the home of one of the greatest Africans who ever lived, Kenneth David Kaunda. And Zambia is a country that I'm fond of. And, and it's sad that young people such as Edja Lungu, when they occupy office, they become paranoid because they are beholden to the Chinese. And therefore, I suspect that because of the stance that I've taken against the Chinese, he felt that I would come to Zambia. I was coming on a very innocent uh, mission to preside over a graduation ceremony. And to be told that I'm a threat to the security of any country is as amusing as it is irritating. I visit many African countries, I have many African heads of state who are my friends, and they have never considered me a threat to security. In fact, they accommodate me, and I, they, I criticize them when it is necessary, I praise them when it is necessary. People like you, Erika Guta Museveni, Paul Kagame, John Joseph Pombe, Magufuli, Nana, Dankwa, Kudoab, Akufuado, uh, Opongwea, uh, Hage Ken Gob, Cyril Ramaphosa. These are men who know that when you are out in the public domain, you don't have to agree on anything. And, and yet President Lungu, in a manner that I've never understood, thinks that when you criticize them, then you are a threat to the security. When somebody says that, then the security of Zambia must be very weak, that an individual from Kenya who arrives in a country can threaten the security of Zambia. And Zambia must be very weak, which I refuse to believe. Mm. But don't you think that is a bit too strong if you describe the president as being paranoid? He's paranoid. If you stop an African citizen to get into your country to preside over graduation, how else can you describe it but paranoia? How else? Tell me. In fact, the word paranoia is not even strong enough. You deny an African who means well for you an opportunity to come and share his thoughts and you are a lawyer who has studied human rights law, who believes in freedom of expression? What kind of a lawyer are you? Mm. Well, you, you, you are coming to speak about, uh, you know, China, Zambia, I mean, China-Africa relations, uh, relationship, the, the, the relationship that Africa shares with China. On, on October 1st of 2018. Allow me to, 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 to take you to that particular uh, subject. Do you think the deal that Africa gets off the relationship that it shares with China as a good deal? It is not. And it is not because we, particularly the polit politicians in Africa, allow themselves to be manipulated by the Chinese. The Chinese are very clear what they want. They want our natural resources. They want that which is in the best interest of the people of China. And they do it very well. If I was Chinese, I would be very happy with my government. But 
Africans and through their leaders allow themselves to be manipulated so that we always get the shorthand of the stick. And that is why we must castigate leaders who are in the business of selling out to the Chinese. You now see the Chinese uh, creating what are called Confucius centers at universities. I believe there is a Confucius center at the University of Zambia. As mm. There is one at the University of Nairobi. And what these centers are designed to do is to indoctrinate us, to make us study Mandarin, and to make us begin thinking like Chinese. We must guard ourselves against that kind of manipulation. This is how the Europeans came, through slavery, ultimately through colonization, and ultimately through the neo-colonial and imperial project. And once again, we see China doing the same thing, and we are not on our guard and our leaders are being manipulated on a daily basis. It is our duty, those of us who love Africa, to shout from the rooftops and tell our leaders, and I am using the word leaders very loosely because I don't think they are leaders. Mm. They are misleaders. Yeah. Well, and tell them out of order. Mm. And that is the duty some of us have undertaken to do in this continent, to yeah. call them out. Yeah, but well, uh, someone would argue, really, I think we've witnessed unprecedented uh, infrastructural development. Even in your country, Kenya, we've witnessed, and you know, there's unprecedented infrastructural development in Kenya, in Tanzania, right here in our beloved country, Zambia. Don't you think, really, China, to some extent, is offering, you know, Africa some form of a good deal? Do you think, are you suggesting to me that we Africans, after over 50 years of independence producing civil engineers, are incapable of developing that kind of infrastructure? Are you suggesting to me that Africa can only have infrastructure when the Chinese construct them? Are you suggesting to me that we are so deeply rooted in mediocrity that we cannot do that for ourselves? They may come with these goodies, but what they are getting out of us is much more. How much have they raided your copper industry? How much have they raided and taken away from Zambia? And what is the quid pro quo? Things that we can do for ourselves. We must never, as Africans for once, believe that we cannot build roads. We can. We must not be led to believe that when people come here and give us things to entice us, that we are children of a lesser God and we cannot achieve these things. We are capable. Why can't the Zambians invite the Nigerians to build bridges for them? Why can't the Kenyans invite the Ghanaians to do bridges for them? Who does bridges for the Chinese? Is there any African who is building a bridge in China? Is there any African who is mining in China? Is there any African who is engage in useful activity in China other than buying their products? Please, let us liberate ourselves from this inferiority complex. Hmm. Well, where do you think this appetite really from China is coming from? I think, you know, they've, they've been developed, they've, they've, they've been, you know, uh, investing, uh, conducting trade in Africa for the past, I should say, 25 years. Where do you think, you know, this appetite is coming from? What is in Africa that our African leaders can't see? You know, our many African leaders, and not all of them, I can uh, isolate a few African leaders who are switched on. President John Joseph Pombe Magufuli knows what he wants. And he has cancelled contracts with Chinese and said, anybody who enters into a contract of this nature must be a fool or a madman. That is a sensible African leader. President Paul Kagame of Rwanda has also done the same thing. The appetite that China has for natural resources is informed by the reality of China at home. They have a population of 1.4 billion. That population must be fed. The Chinese leaders have, have decided that they want to make China the factory of the world. And they have an insatiable appetite for African natural resources. They have appetite for copper. They have appetite for coltan. They have appetite for uranium. They have appetite for diamond. They have appetite for timber. It is insatiable. They are gluttonous. 
and it is our duty to checkmate them before they consume us. If we don't, mm. in the next 20 years, our new colonizer, in a very subtle way, will be China. Mm. But how then do we ensure that we have a win-to-win -win situation when dealing with China? Two things. Zambia, your country, is a member of SADC. And SADC is a regional body comprising 14 countries. In East Africa, we have the East, East African community. In West Africa, we have the ECOWAS. In Central Africa, we have the Central African community. And in the North, we have the Maghreb. When we deal with China, we must negotiate regionally. And beyond that, we must negotiate continentally. And you remember that there is the Africa continental free trade area which ought to have taken effect on the first day of July, but for COVID and is going to take effect from the month of January 2021. When we negotiate with China, let us negotiate con regionally or continentally, because in that way we are strong. You imagine Deng Xiaoping negotiating with the Prime Minister of Lesotho, which is ten times smaller than Beijing. There is no negotiation there. It is simply manipulation. But if you negotiate in the context of SADAC, then you are negotiating as a strong team with a population of nearly 300 million. And that is a big market, bigger than the market of the United States of America. If you are negotiating with an ECOWAS, you have a population of nearly 400 million. You are negotiating in East Africa. You have a population of another nearly 300 million. You are negotiating with the Maghreb, another 200 million then you are beginning to make sense from an economic perspective and China will respect you. So some mm. of the things that Africans must stop doing is attending these meetings, TCAD, Japan calling African leaders to go to Tokyo, Japan, China calling African leaders to go to Beijing, the Arabs calling African leaders to go to Dubai, the European Union calling, summoning African leaders to go to Davos. The time has come. We have been summoned for too long. The time has come that we must mm. be met on our own terms. Yeah. Well, to, to me, that requires the, the men and women of resolve. Yeah. Well, to me, the solutions you've given, uh, Prof, don't seem to be very technical. I feel this is uh, information that uh, you know is even at the fingertips of our African leaders. What or why do you think we have not taken that particular stance so that our negotiations? you know, can have a win-to-win -win situation. There, there is nothing technical about what I've said. If you look at the constitutive documents of the East African Community Treaty of 1999, you look at the ECOWAS uh, Treaty, and only two weeks, uh, in fact, a few days ago, the ECOWAS met in Niamey, Niger, and President Nana Dankwa Kufuada was elected as the, as, the, as the chairman. There is nothing technical. These are actually in the constitutive documents. If you go to SADAC, you'll find it is in the constitutive documents. If you go to the African Union, it's in the constitutive documents. You go to the African Charter, or rather African Continental Free Trade Area, it is there. And if you go a little further in the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980, it is there. If you go to the Lomé Convention of 1975, it is there. If you go to the Cotonou Convention of 2000, it's there. All these things are there. What we lack are men and women of resolve and vision. Men and women who are capable of identifying and prioritizing what is in the best interest of Africa. And we also have you people in the media. You are also part of the African problem. Because you are trained to think in a manner that is Eurocentric, sometimes the questions you ask are also not helping anybody. They are self-serving, they are meant to catch what I call sound bites, and you don't go into the depths. So the African media is also part of the African problem. The mm -hmm. African population is also part of the African problem because of ignorance. So you, the media, must wake up because you are consuming news that is manufactured by realtors, news that is manufactured by Xinhua, news that is manufactured by AFP, there is no thinking in the African media. 
the questions that you ask are rudimentary and basic and not useful to any African. So you too must tile up if Africa is to realize our potential. Mm. How then do we begin slowly you know, to realize the potential you know, that we have? A number of things, and I'll give you practical examples. Rwanda, 1994, genocide, her obituary written, the world had abandoned her. 25 years later, leadership that is focused, that knows what it wants, if you haven't visited Kigali, visit Kigali. Forget these people that you see in social media, Instagram and Twitter, who are Kagame haters. Let them go to Rwanda and see what that administration has done. Go to Tanzania in five years. Go to Dar es Salaam. Go to Mwanza. Go to Dodoma. See what that administration has done. Go to Ethiopia and see what Prime Minister Abiy has done. Go to Ghana. Despite the protestations of the naysayers and professional fault finders, and see what has been done. Go to Namibia and see what Hage Gengob has done. Go to Botswana. Go to Mauritius and see what has been done. Many people that you see, particularly on social media, who are quick with their fingers on Instagram and Twitter and all these other medias, these are armchair theorists whose only claim to fame is that they find fault. They have a problem for every solution. But I who travel across Africa and see what is happening on the ground, I can tell you for a fact that there are African leaders and African professionals who are doing great things. Mm. Look at our own, uh, in the business world, look at our own, uh, in Kenya, James Mwangi in the banking industry. Look at Aliko Dangote in Nigeria. Look at Obi Jackson. Look at Tim Tebela. In, in, in South Africa, look at Patrice Mosepe and many other people who are doing great work in the African scene. And people don't talk about this. We talk about Ronaldo and Lionel Messi and how many goals they scored as if that was any important chasing a little ball around the field. Yeah. Let's come to your general assessment of uh, how you know, governance is being transacted in the continent of Africa. What is your general assessment of how, you know, uh, leadership is transacted in, 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 in Africa? First of all, I have a problem on a number of scores. The conceptual West, to mean the United States of America, which is the hegemon in the West, and the traditional West, and Australia and New Zealand, made us to believe that democracy equals to multi-party politics, democracy equals to periodic election, democracy equals. I'm now of the view that there is not a one-size-fits-all democracy and that Africa must now begin to re-examine how she governs herself in different ways. Because what is democracy when all is said and done? Democracy is a government that allows people to participate in determining who will lead them. And that leader is a servant. It is not the duty of the Western world to tell us what to do. And that is why you see many Western embassies and ambassadors are very arrogant. They come to Africa and a little ambassador from the United States of America wants to dictate to the Zambian president and the Zambian people. An ambassador from some backwater country in Europe thinks that he is some kind of demigod who tells us what to do. And our leaders also accept it. The time has come that leaders in Africa must respect human rights. They must respect freedom of expression. They must respect the fact that their position of leadership is position of servanthood. And they must accept that no matter how good a dancer you are, you must know when to leave the stage. They must accept that leadership is intergenerational and co-generational. They must also appreciate that we are a diverse and heterogeneous society and therefore they must include everybody. Once that happens, then leaders in Africa, including Eja Lungu, whom I respect but I don't agree with on many issues, will begin to govern in a manner that is in the best interest of their countries and the continent of Africa. Otherwise, they are completely unremarkable. In Zambia, the, look at your first leaders. They were remarkable people. 
people like Mwanga, people like Kapwepe, people like Kaunda, people like Levi Mwanawasa. These were effective people, but, but you now have dwarfs as leaders. Well, you, you, you've spoken of, you know, of the fact that you don't agree with President Lungu on a number of issues. What are some of those issues that you don't agree with him on? First of all, he's running the economy very badly. The economy of Zambia is not doing well, and he knows it. Secondly, he's intolerant to the opposition. He is not a democrat. And thirdly, he's the demagogue who doesn't believe in issues. And fourthly, he's paranoid. And, and when you have that combination, that cocktail of characteristics, the net effect is that you can't serve your country well. I look to the day, personally, because he denied me entry into Zambia. I look to the day when he'll invite me to Zambia and tell me what he thinks. I remember in Malawi, I had criticized President Professor Patrick Wamutarika, but he invited me to Malawi in Lilongwe, and I sat with him at the State House, and I told him why I disagreed with him. And ultimately, my point of disagreement is what caused his removal by President Chakwera. Because I told him, President, you cannot run a country where you are saying that you cannot deal with corruption. And he told me, but I'm just one person. I said, but you are the president. You want us to praise you when things are happening well. But when things are not happening well, you want us to forget it? Mm. President Lungu, who is a lawyer like me, who went to law school and went through a course in human rights, a course in jurisprudence, is so intolerant that when at one time uh, Hakainde Hichilema was uh, charged with a traffic offense of blocking him, he said it was treasonable. Is that a lawyer who can say that a traffic offense is treason? You can see why I fault President Lungu. Yeah, well, you, you, you sound so bitter. <laughs> No, I'm not. No, I don't. I'm passionate. You yeah, must I, distinguish do, do passion you have, do, and bitterness. Do you have anything personal? Why should I be bitter? I'm not a citizen of Zambia. I survive in Kenya. I don't, if I'm not invited, I'm simply, you must be in a position. That is the problem with you journalists. The inability to distinguish between passion and bitterness. Hmm. And that is a very typical African journalist speaking to me now. Yeah, you, you've spoken about one issue really that is very critical. Uh, you know, you, you spoke about corruption. Now we do know for a fact that the corruption situation in Africa keeps on getting worse. Let's get to the conversation of corruption. Why is this so? It is so because as a people and a society, we are very tolerant. We celebrate thieves. And because we are tolerant and we allow thieves to thrive, uh, the thieves uh, think that they can run roughshod over us. Until the day that we are going to punish those who engage in corruption, and I've said it not once, not twice, but times without number, that corruption should be treated as a crime against humanity. The Chinese who come to Africa and bribe our leaders in their own country, if you engage in corruption, you'll be executed. But when they come to Africa, they think that money paid as corruption is a business expense. So it is the duty of the people of African countries to, in, be, to be intolerant to corruption. Once that begins to happen, then those who engage in corruption will know that their ill-gotten wealth will not be accommodated. Right mm. now, because partly because of our ethnicity, if somebody is a thief from your country, then you think that their corruption ought not to be condemned. We are in, in Kenya, for example, right now, people are being arrested under our DCI, the DPP, and the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Authority are doing a good job. But what happens is that when you arrest these people, the people from their ethnic group come out and say, he is a thief, but he is our thief. Mm. Terrible. You, you've, you've highly spoken about the magulification of Africa uh, to, 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 you know, to end corruption. What is the interpretation of the magulification of Africa? When I spoke about magulification, 
President John Joseph Pombe Magufuli had been in power for barely one year. I know there are those who are saying that he's intolerant to the, to the opposition. There are those who have many things, and, and, and that will always, always be said. But if you look at what President John Joseph Pombe Magufuli has done during the five years that he has served as the President of the United Republic of Tanzania in different sectors, you go to the mining sector. We now have 27 selling centers for gold in Tanzania. The Canadian companies and those Australian companies that have not paid tax, pay taxes in the tune of 2 billion United States dollars have now paid the taxes. You go into the area of cashew nuts, that is in the area of agriculture. You find that he has done things that has benefited the people. You go into the area of infrastructure. You go to Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam is the only East African capital that has a working public transport system. You go into the area of aviation. He found a floundering Air Tanzania. He has now revived it. You go into the road infrastructure across Tanzania. And what is governance? Governance is improving the life and quality of people's well-being. And his administration, the fifth administration in Tanzania, has done a good job in that regard. And my thesis was that if we want to improve Africa, you must have leaders of that ilk. Mm. If I was speaking in, 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 in Rwanda, perhaps I would have talked about the Kagameization, because Paul Kagame has also done a similar thing. And, and ought to be celebrated despite many detractors thinking otherwise. Hmm. What is amazing in Africa is that those who are doing a good job are always vilified by the West. And, and one of the things that you must be very worried about some of these uh, individuals who criticize African leaders, many of them are in the NGO world. These proposal writing individuals who are dependent on, on, on funds from George Soros and other Western organizations. And what they do is to pretend that they are holier than thou. These individuals, in my view, ought to be understood in that context, unless they irritate and make noise. Their funders in Europe and America will not give them funds. Yeah. Magulification means that which is in the best interest of Africa. Mm, you've spoken about Tanzania and uh, Rwanda being, you know, some form of examples to Africa's uh, uh, fight against corruption. What, what would you point as? What, what would you point at as uh, you know the fundamentals that have gotten right in the fight against corruption? I think what has happened in uh, in a number of countries, and, and, and I'll mention a number of countries where I think the fight against corruption has been spirited. Of course, it is not an easy fight. Remember that the corrupt. Uh, very all well-oiled people, politically connected. But you will see, for example, in a country such as Rwanda, that if you engage in corruption, you will be punished. And punishment is at the tail end of it. In Rwanda, for example, if you wanted to incorporate a company, and I've tried this myself, I arrived in Kigali one morning, and I applied for the registration of a company and within five hours, the company was incorporated. You go to Kigali and you attempt to bribe a police officer, they'll arrest you. Because they know that there is political will. The same thing in Tanzania. You apply for something and it will be given to you. And I think that that is what we ought to do in the fight against corruption. And of course, they are the anti-corruption authorities. If you go to Tanzania, the anti-corruption authority is well resourced. In Rwanda, it is well resourced. In Botswana, it is well resourced. In uh, uh, Mauritius, it is well resourced. I used to be familiar with your own Zambian, but it's very weak now because the political will is not very strong. In Malawi, it was also very weak during the administration of President Professor Patrick Wamutarika. Now that Chakwera has come in, I believe that it could be stronger if Chakwera remains faithful to the agenda that is put in place. So it is political will. This is the alpha and omega. Once there is political will, then the people will follow the leaders in the right direction.
But if there is no leadership at the top, then there is a problem. We say in Kiswahili, the fish rots from the head. Yeah, but, but then really, I, I do know for a fact that you served as the director of Anti-Corruption Commission you know, uh, in, in, in your country from about uh, September 2010 uh, to August 2011. What would you say, yes. really, from, from, from your experience as director, you know? When, when I speak, I speak from experience. Exactly. You, one of the things that you, whether you like me or not, is this, that of all the directors who have served, I'm the only one, to my credit, who still remains a crusader, which means, whether you like me or not, that to me it was not a job. It was a crusade. Mm. It was a crusade. And that is why 10 years down the line, I'm still at it. Yeah. Because I believe that corruption is a crime against humanity. And my experience is this, that the political class in Africa will speak against corruption, but that is the language of the lips. Many of them are partakers of the corrupt things. They will fight you. They will come to podiums and condemn corruption. But the truth is, they are not interested in corruption, in the fight against corruption. Just today, somebody sent me a very interesting message, which I will want to share with you. And this is what the message says, that the politician in Africa, when they want to organize people to engage in chaos, they organize other people's children. But when they get into power and they want to steal, they steal with their children and their relatives. This is the nature of the African politician. Mm. Uh, you've spoke about one important issue, really, uh, you know, that I think is of great concern to many African countries. The fact that there's, there's been a lot of political interference in the, in the running of uh, you know, the Anti-Corruption Commission in those respective countries. How do we begin to align... Uh, you know, uh, laws that empowers uh, the autonomy of these agencies? You know, in many of these countries... Uh, and just, just an additional, Professor, just an additional. If you, uh, I'd like to know if, how, you know, the, the Kenyan, uh, how the Kenyan system uh, is like. I will tell you how it is. But the most important thing is this. If you look at the black let a law in many countries there is no problem with the law the laws effectively in many countries mirror the united nations convention against corruption of 2003 and the african convention for preventing and combating corruption of 2000 the african charter for preventing and combating corruption so there is nothing wrong with the law the problem is with political will and this is where you need a political leadership that is wedded to the idea that if corruption is not fought, it will undermine democracy. Mm. It will undermine the economy. Once a leader appreciates that, then that leader will be in the forefront in supporting the anti-corruption body. And I've seen that in the countries that I've already mentioned. I've already mentioned Tanzania. I've mentioned uh, Rwanda, I've mentioned Botswana, I've mentioned Mauritius, I've mentioned Ghana, who, despite other problems, I think the Ghanaians have done a reasonably good job. Sierra Leone has also been also trying to do a good job. And it varies from countries to country. But remember that many politicians are themselves engaged in corruption. And therefore they want to manipulate these bodies. In Kenya for the time being, I think that the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission is doing a very good job. Mm. They are doing a good job because despite our many problems, I think there is a sense in which the Kenyan president, whether he may have other problems, but on the issue of corruption, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think 6 out of 10, he is convicted and converted to the idea that corruption must be fought. And that does energize the anti-corruption authority. And mm. that is why, even as I speak to you t today, one go yes, the day before yesterday, a governor was arraigned in court. On Monday, another governor will be arraigned in court. Uh, on Monday, another one. Th these are individuals who would be untouchable. These would be sacred cows. 
but they are being touched by the day. And I think that political will is very critical in the fight against corruption. You know that you, 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 you've, you've, you've been following um, trends across Africa when it comes to corruption. I, I want to bring it down to Zambia. Um, uh, you know, a, a, few, a few weeks ago, um, the, the president you know, issued a statement warning the Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, the president stated that uh, they are targeting him to ensure that there is a regime change. I don't know if, if, if you came across uh, you know, such news from our country. Oh, that uh, he said that uh, the anti-corruption anti anti body is being used to, re to change the regime. Yes, yeah. But, but really, what, what does this tell us uh, if we have a sitting uh, the, president in that, that statement? That tells you that that kind of president is not interested in the fight against corruption. Because the duty of, anti -corruption, of an anti-corruption body is to follow individuals who are engaged in corrupt activities in accordance with the law. If you have cabinet ministers who are engaged in corruption and an anti-corruption authority investigates them and they are found to be culpable, then they ought to be taken to court. If you then interpret that as a regime change, then that regime ought to be changed. A corrupt regime needs to be changed. Yeah. And the anti-corruption authorities should not apologize at all if they have evidence. Yeah. We, we, we have situations where, you know, some of our ministers uh, are found wanting of corruption allegations. Uh, the call by civil society organizations and political parties, opposition political parties, you know, has consistent, consistently been that if there's a minister that is found with charges to answer, Mr. President, ensure that uh, you excuse them of their duties. But the President of Zambia hasn't done so. What does this tell us, really, about the commitment uh, you know, that the President has to the fight against corruption? The President of Zambia is not committed to the fight against corruption. Zambians know it. I travel across Africa and I hear people other than myself giving uh, Zambia as an example of a country whose leadership is not interested in the fight against corruption. We know it. He's not interested in the fight against corruption. And for that reason, he is not going to be enthusiastic. Yeah, but, but really, so yeah. until, the, until the day that he is serious in the fight against corruption, corruption is going to thrive in Zambia. Yeah. But really, Prof, the debate uh, surrounding that issue has been that uh, the law is clear that uh, this presumption of innocence until you are proven otherwise. And that, that is, that is, a, that is a, you know, the, the legal backing that the president has been standing on. That, look, I can't fire my ministers. They have not yet been proven guilty. I will let them save. Uh, if they are proven guilty, well, I will excuse them. That, that, is, a lame, uh, that is a lame excuse. If you are a cabinet minister and you are being investigated for corruption, we are saying that you step down. We are not saying you are guilty. We are saying that morally it is improper that you continue to be in the same office during investigation because of your power, you will interfere with investigation. Once you are cleared, you can then resume office. And there is no shortage of Zambians who can be a minister. What does it take to be a minister anyway? What does it? it does, is it telling us that, that there are only people who are born to be ministers and that if they are not ministers, Zambia, Zambia will collapse? In, in, during the administration of President Levy Mwanawasa, that was a president who believed in the fight against corruption. And you could see it and Zambians could feel it. When there is a president who means business, it is self-evident. Levy Mwanawasa was a president who believed it. The mm. current president does not believe one iota. President Chiluba in his early days appeared to believe it. But in his latter days he lost the script. So it is quite self-evident. And you Zambians are, know about it. You, you, you know the, the, the performance of this administration. It's mediocre. Yeah. But let me just try, you know, uh, 
th there are thousands of people watching us live right now, uh, Professor, and, and, and I want you to give us an overview picture of, uh, you know, the gravity that corruption has to the detriment of a nation. You know, my, my very good friend, Africa as a continent has a population of nearly 1.4 billion people. High GDP, all the 55 countries of Africa, is slightly over 2 trillion United States dollars. The GDP of Brazil, which has a population of less than 200 million, is about 2.5 trillion dollars. The GDP of Germany, with a population of 80 million, is 4 trillion dollars. The GDP of the United States of America with a population of slightly under 300 million is 19 trillion dollars. Yet in terms, of in terms of resources, there is not a continent with resources like the continent of Africa. The reason why we are where we are is because our leaders do not understand what their role is. And because our leaders, many of them, are engaged in corruption. Look at any country in Africa. Look at the Mobutus of this world who owned concords and presided over countries that were rich, resource rich, but were poor in fact. Look at Sani Abacha in Nigeria. Look at Yai Jame in the Gambia. Look at Paul Bia in the Cameroons. Look at Obiang Gwema in Equatorial Guinea. I need not mention all of them. These are kleptocrats running kleptocracies. And how does Africa suffer? Low life expectancy, infant mortality, maternal mortality, death from malaria, polio, yellow fever, malnutrition, Kwashako, poor education facilities, poor harvest, lack of portable water, poor infrastructure, poor everything, because our leaders are engaged in corruption. Our democrat so-called democratic processes are also manipulated because we have people who seek the vote by buying the electorate. So our politics has no hygiene. Corruption is a cancer in our body politic and until the day that we destroy it, it will continue to metastasize to mm. the detriment of our continent. Many have argued really about this conversation, Prof, that Africa needs strong systems and not good leaders. Well, others argue to the contrary that uh, we need good leaders as opposed to strong systems, because we already have strong systems, but the ones who are pre presiding over these systems are corrupt. What is your thought? No, there is a, perhaps there is a misnomer there. What, what, when you say strong systems, what do you really mean? When you say strong leaders, we only need men and women who mean well for the society. And I'm a believer in institutions. I don't believe in leaders who are like Moses in the Bible who are miracle workers with a rod in their staff, parting red seas and summoning manna and quail to come from the heaven. No. I believe in institutions which are strong and those who preside over them are subject to checks and balances. I believe in a population that is aware and who make demands of their leaders. Democracy, if however defined, requires that the citizens must be eternally vigilant. If you have a population that is not vigilant, a population that is manipulated on the base of man basis of money and ethnic affiliation, then that kind of population is a danger to democracy. So I believe in institutions which work and thrive, and I believe that those institutions must be presided over by men and women who have goodwill, who are subject to check, because power is capable of being abused but by even the best of men and the best of women. Once we have that, I believe that Africa is capable of performing just as other people perform in other civilizations. And I can begin to see, I've already given examples, countries that are functioning, 
countries like uh, like uh, Botswana, which have continued to strive to thrive, and you've seen the change of leaders from Sasirese Kama to to Ketumile Masire to Festus Mohai to Ian Kama, now President Masisi, and you go to Tanzania from President Julius Kambarake Nyerere to Ali Hassan Mwinyi to Benjamin William Kapa to Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete to John Joseph Pombe Magufuli and even when you come to Kenya despite our problems we have had Jomo Kenyatta, Daniel Moy, Mwai Kibaki and Uhuru Kenyatta there is a sense even in your own country despite your many the many problems that you continue to have we had President Kenneth Kaunda, we had President Chiluba, President Mwanawasa and we now have President Lungu there is a sense in which that kind of thing happens because certain things are beginning to mature so in as much as we condemn or critique, I don't want to be called a crit, I don't criticize, I critique mm. rather passionately. There is a sense in which even when you see that there are problems, the fact that the countries continue to be a going concern, it means that there are certain things that are being done well. Our duty is to improve them so that going forward we don't continue to play with flyweights when we are essentially heavyweights. Yeah. Well, uh, Prof, you agree with me that the idea of leadership is servanthood. Uh, we've seen, yes. you know, n a number of uh, African leaders after, uh, you know, coming to the helm of leadership, they begin acting like bosses. Do you think Africa is ready for servant leadership? Let, let me... Africa has always been ready for good things. The idea that Africa is not ready for good things is in itself a misnomer. I, I am reading a book which is about Julius Kambarage Nyerere. And, and, and Nyerere was very interesting when he was alive. This is uh, the note that he wrote. Uh, to, he wrote, uh, he asked his secretary to write to the then mayor of Dar es Salaam. And he said, I've always said and I repeat to you again, I do not want anything to be named after me as long as I'm alive. Do not name any streets. Do not name any alley, do not name any study after me. I do not care what happens to me when I'm dead. That is a servant leader. Mm. And I had the privilege in, 1900 and in the 1990s to serve in his foundation. And Nyerere moved in Dar es Salaam in a car and obeyed traffic lights. He did not have to do it. Your own Kenneth David Kaunda, if you read Why Africa is Poor, and what Africans can do it by Greg Mills. When he left office, he had only the equivalent of 8,000 United States dollars after serving in office for over 20 years. That is honesty personified. If you need an icon in Zambia, Kenneth David Kaunda. Yeah. Well, uh, you agree with me that Africa is yet again um, witnessing an increase in uh, you know, number of constitutional amendments. Uh, you know, many have argued that uh, these constitutional amendments are there to perpetuate the stay of the incumbent in, in office. I think we did see in Congo, we did see in many other countries, and well, we, we are seeing, you know, a bit of that in, in Zambia, where we are now currently trying to amend our constitution ahead of, uh, you know, the elections next year. What is your comment, really, in, uh, you know, in, in African countries that uh, continuously? Uh, you know, in the period of elections, are trying to amend their constitutions. Zambia is not the only country. Right now, we are grappling with, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, Alison Watara, who wants to serve a third term. In Guinea Conakry, Alpha Conde wants to do the same thing. In Mali, you saw Abu Bakar Keita wanting to do the same thing. And happily, he was removed from office by a people revolution. And, and, and this, this, Individuals who don't want to leave the stage, there is an African saying that if a bird perches on a tree for too long, it invites stones. And that is the problem, that is something that African leaders don't recognize. A constitution is a sacred document, a contract between the people and the governance, and it ought to be amended only when it is necessary. The American Constitution is over 200 years old and it has only been amended, I think, 27 times. And the first 10 amendments were made in the very year of the Constitution. And if you look at each one of those amendments, there was a reason why there was an amendment. I 
look at leaders who want to amend constitution to perpetuate themselves in power as megalomaniacs, egotistical megalomaniacs who ought not to be given the opportunity to serve. And, and, and they must know that in the fullness of time, the people will remove them. You know, a few, a month ago, President Keita in Mali thought that he was immovable. Where is he now? He is sick in Abu Dhabi. I wish him well, but I'm happy that he was removed from office. Um, I wish and look forward to the day when next week or the week after next, Alpha Conde will be removed from office in Guinea Conakry. I look forward to the removal of Paul Bia and the Adema in Equatorial Guinea and Alpha Conde in Guinea Conakry. These individuals must serve and live. Why do they want to change the constitution? They don't think that the women in Zambia cease to give birth to men and women who can serve their countries? Do they think they are demigods? These are people who suffer from what is called the Jehovah complex. The assumption by misguided individuals that they are gods. Yeah, the well, there's, must not... there's a similar situation right here in Zambia. Now we are, we are amending our constitution. Uh, we are calling this particular bill as, uh, you know, the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 10 of 2019. Uh, I, I, I presume that you followed, uh, you know, the arguments. But one of the arguments that is on top of the agenda is the eligibility of President Lungu to contest the 2021 general elections. Other schools of thought feel uh, if he contests, he will be contesting for, for, for the third time. Uh, have, you, have you followed this discussion um, happening in Zambia. I follow it very keenly. I read the debate. President Lungu is a lawyer. He knows that his arguments are lame. This argument that he inherited a presidency and therefore that he is eligible again is without basis. He has not served Zambia well. He knows it. What is he going to do in his third term if he gets it? He should leave stage and do so in dignity. There are a lot of things to be done when he leaves office. Let him ask President Olusha Gunobasanjo, who is a very good friend of mine. Let him ask President Jakayam Risho Kikwete. Let him ask many presidents who have retired. When you retire, let him ask President Joachim Chisano. Let him ask Tumile Masiri and Festus Mohai. Let him ask uh, Tabombeki. He'll know that there are beautiful things that can be done when you leave office in dignity. Mm. He can form a Eja Lungu Foundation and begin to do good things. Yeah, but, but, but uh, these are something uh, that he must uh, remain in you, office. I, I cannot, I, I can your, never. And yeah. for, you know why Lungu really surprises me? It's because he's a lawyer who should know better. If you are dealing with Idi Amin or Jean Bedel Bokas, I would understand. But a, a young lawyer. Yeah, but I, I wanted to get your, you know, your, your legal opinion on this particular one. I do know for a, for a fact that uh, you, you've taken a look at uh, our current constitution when it comes to uh, the number of times one can serve in office. I, I want a legal opinion from you, uh, from, from your perspective. You know, the number of terms is, must be determined by every country. Zambia did make a decision, I believe, that a president will serve for a maximum of two terms, each term five years. Yeah. If that is the Zambian constitution, these other sophistry, the, the sophistry and arguments that the administration of President uh, Lungu is putting forth and Lungu is putting forth that is eligible because of some kind of... I, I understand that lame argument, but it's complete. Is an argument that is dead on arrival, and he knows it. But because he's an incumbent, he's trying to use it to contest. If I were him, and I hope, I hope that he has advisor to whom he listens, and, and I hope that there are clergymen whom he listens to, let him be told, nobody is going to take you to jail. We know you may have engaged in things that ought not to be done properly, but we can grant you amnesty so that you are not arrested when you leave office. Please leave. Leave in dignity. Go and serve, serve the continent of Africa so that Zambia may remember you fondly. Let him go and visit Kenneth David Kaunda and see what dignity is. He is lucky that in Zambia there is a president who is dignified, who is respected, who is 95 years of age, who lost an election and accepted and went home.
and he is a great man. If Lungu does that, all his sins will be forgiven him. Let, his not, let him not engage in this legal sophistry. Let him not. Yeah. Well, well, well Prof, um, others, uh, you know, argue with you, uh, you know, when you make, you know, such statements. And, and, and I'm going to read you something quickly uh, that someone posted after we advertised, uh, you know, this program on Twitter. And so he says, uh, P. O. Lumumba is just a motivational speaker with no track record or actualized success. Ask him to share with us. Ask him you know, such people, those are him. people whom I dismiss yeah. because he doesn't know what I've done. So I'm not a motivational speaker. I've, I'm a lawyer of 33 years standing. I'm a person who has uh, run a successful legal practice. I served as the Secretary of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. I was the founding dean of the Kabarak Law School. I taught at the University of Nairobi. I was the director of the Anti-Corruption Authority. I was the director of the Kenya School of Law. That individual who must be an envious, stupid individual, what has he done? Can he rival my credentials which I've just listed? Can he? Yeah, All right. I, I thought I should just bring in that, that, that particular one. But the poverty situation also uh, is still getting worse and, uh, you know, in, in Africa. Really, what, what, what would you say has caused the poverty levels to continuously increase in the continent of Africa? Even, 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 when, she's blessed with, uh, even, even when she's blessed with natural resources. It is leadership. Everything falls, rises and falls on leadership. When you have a leadership that is not switched on, then all sectors of the economy fall. I would want you to read a book written by Lee Kuan Yew from the third world to the first world and see how Lee Kuan Yew with his friends succeeded in lifting Africa, or rather Singapore, from a backwater country that has been expelled from Malaysian Federation and where Singapore is right now. If you go to South Korea after the war in 1953, then you will see what leadership is all about. It all falls on leadership, and, 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 and it's important. But I want to respond to that stupid individual who doesn't know me. Mm. I ran a foundation with a presence in 38 African countries. What has he done in his village? Mm. Well, he argues yes. that... Uh... So, you, know, you know, there are some individuals, these are the ones who I tell you because, number one, they are envious, some of them. Mm. Because they are envious, they, 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 they want to find an excuse. And I would want to know such individuals so that you dress them down. But the truth be told, Martin Luther King Jr. used to say when he was in the Birmingham prison, that if you worry about critics, you never do anything. They'll always be there. Even in heaven, God has a critic called Satan. Mm. All right. But, but as we close the show, Zambia is headed to the polls uh, on the 12th of August next year. What is your guidance, really, as we get to the polls uh, next year as a country? It is the duty of the Zambians to elect a leader of their choice. I know that there are candidates, but my advice to Zambia, choose a man or a woman who will help you to realize your potential. Choose a leader who will make Zambia be a great country, a Zambia that will be great in agriculture, a Zambia that will be great in the health sector, a Zambia that will be great in education. And I believe there is no shortage of such leaders. And, and I'm partial myself, despite all what other critics will say, but I believe Hakainde Hichilema is somebody that Zambians should try. Well, thank you so much for having made time uh, to speak with us, Professor. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much, and God bless you. All right. I was speaking to Professor Lumumba all the way from Kenya. We're discussing the state of Africa's governance. I've been your host. My name is Andrew Monson. And on behalf of my production crew, Mavuto um, Piri, thank you so much for having made this possible. For now, good night and enjoy the rest of our programming. Thank you. Thank you.